Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to Horror Babble. Today, I will be reading An Authentic Narrative of a Haunted House by Sheridan Le Fano. An Authentic Narrative of a Haunted House by Sheridan Le Fano. The editor of the University magazine submits the following very remarkable statement, with every detail of which he has been for some years acquainted, upon the ground that it affords the most authentic and ample relation of a series of marvellous phenomena, in no wise connected with what is technically termed spiritualism, which he has anywhere met with. All the persons, and there are many of them living, upon whose separate evidence some parts, and upon whose united testimony others, of this most singular recital depend, are, in their several walks of life, respectable, and such as would in any matter of judicial investigation be deemed wholly unexceptionable witnesses. There is not an incident here recorded which would not have been distinctly deposed to on oath had any necessity existed by the persons who severally, and some of them in great fear, related their own distinct experiences. The editor begs most pointedly to meet in Limini the suspicion, that he is elaborating a trick, or vouching for another ghost of Mrs. Veal. As a mere story, the narrative is valueless. Its sole claim to attention is its absolute truth. For the good faith of its relator, he pledges his own and the character of this magazine. With the editor's concurrence, the name of the watering-place, and some special circumstances in no essential way bearing upon the peculiar character of the story, but which might have indicated the locality, and possibly annoyed persons interested in house-property there, have been suppressed by the narrator. Not the slightest liberty has been taken with the narrative, which is presented precisely in the terms in which the writer of it, who employs throughout the first person, would, if need were, fix it in the form of an affidavit. Within the last eight years, the precise date I purposely omit, I was ordered by my physician, my health being in an unsatisfactory state, to change my residence to one upon the sea-coast, and accordingly I took a house for a year in a fashionable watering-place, at a moderate distance from the city in which I had previously resided, and connected with it by a railway. Winter was setting in when my removal thither was decided upon, but there was nothing whatever dismal or depressing in the change. The house I had taken was to all appearance, and in point of convenience too, quite a modern one. It formed one in a cheerful row, with small gardens in front facing the sea, and commanding sea air and sea views in perfection. In the rear it had coach-house and stable, and between them and the house a considerable grass-plot, with some flower-beds interposed. Our family consisted of my wife and myself, with three children, the eldest about nine years old, she and the next in age being girls, and the youngest, between six and seven, a boy. To these were added six servants, whom, although for certain reasons I decline giving their real names, I shall indicate, for the sake of clearness, by arbitrary ones. There was a nurse, Mrs. Sutherland, a nursery-maid, Ellen Page, the cook, Mrs. Greenwood, and the housemaid, Ellen Faith, a butler, whom I shall call Smith, and his son, James, about two and twenty. We came out to take possession at about seven o'clock in the evening. Everything was comfortable and cheery, good fires lighted, the rooms neat and airy, and a general air of preparation and comfort— highly conductive to good spirits and pleasant anticipations. The sitting-rooms were large and cheerful, and they and the bedrooms more than ordinarily lofty. The kitchen and servants' rooms, on the same level, were well and comfortably furnished, and had, like the rest of the house, an air of recent painting and fitting up, and a completely modern character, which imparted a very cheerful air of cleanliness and convenience. There had been just enough of the fuss of settling agreeably to occupy us, and to give a pleasant turn to our thoughts after we had retired to our rooms. Being an invalid, I had a small bed to myself, resigning the four-poster to my wife. The candle was extinguished, but a nightlight was burning. I was coming upstairs, and she, already in bed, 
had just dismissed her maid when we were both startled by a wild scream from her room. I found her in a state of the extremest agitation and terror. She insisted that she had seen an unnaturally tall figure come beside her bed and stand there. The light was too faint to enable her to define anything respecting this apparition, beyond the fact of her having most distinctly seen such a shape, colourless from the insufficiency of the light, to disclose more than its dark outline. We both endeavoured to reassure her. The room once more looked so cheerful in the candlelight that we were quite uninfluenced by the contagion of her terrors. The movements and voices of the servants downstairs, still getting things into their places and completing our comfortable arrangements, had also their effect in stealing us against any such influence, and we set the whole thing down as a dream, or an imperfectly seen outline of the bed curtains. When, however, we were alone, my wife reiterated, still in great agitation, her clear assertion that she had most positively seen— being at the time as completely awake as ever she was, precisely what she had described to us, and in this conviction she continued perfectly firm. A day or two after this, it came out that our servants were under an apprehension that, somehow or other, thieves had established a secret mode of access to the lower part of the house. The butler, Smith, had seen an ill-looking woman in his room on the first night of our arrival, and he and other servants constantly saw, for many days subsequently, glimpses of a retreating figure, which corresponded with that so seen by him passing through a passage which led to a back area, in which were some coal vaults. This figure was seen always in the act of retreating, its back turned, generally getting round the corner of the passage into the area in a stealthy and hurried way, and— when closely followed, imperfectly seen again entering one of the coal vaults, and when pursued into it, nowhere to be found. The idea of anything supernatural in the matter had, strange to say, not yet entered the mind of any one of the servants. They had heard some stories of smugglers having secret passages into houses, and using their means of access for purposes of pillage, or with a view to frighten superstitious people out of houses which they needed for their own objects— and a suspicion of similar practices here caused them extreme uneasiness. The apparent anxiety also manifested by this retreating figure to escape observation, and her always appearing to make her egress at the same point, favoured this romantic hypothesis. The men, however, made a most careful examination of the back area, and of the coal vaults, with a view to discover some mode of egress, but entirely without success. On the contrary— the result was, so far as it went, subversive of the theory. Solid masonry met them on every hand. I called the man, Smith, up to hear from his own lips the particulars of what he had seen, and certainly his report was very curious. I give it as literally as my memory enables me. His son slept in the same room, and was sound asleep, but he lay awake, as men sometimes will on a change of bed, and having many things on his mind. He was lying with his face towards the wall, but, observing a light and some little stir in the room, he turned round in his bed, and saw the figure of a woman, squalid and ragged in dress, a figure rather low and broad, as well as I recollect, she had something, either a cloak or shawl on, and wore a bonnet. Her back was turned, and she appeared to be searching or rummaging for something on the floor, and, without appearing to observe him, she turned, in doing so, towards him. The light, which was more like the intense glow of a coal, as he described it, being of a deep red colour, proceeded from the hollow of her hand, which she held beside her head, and he saw her perfectly distinctly. She appeared middle-aged, was deeply pitted with the smallpox, and blind of one eye. His phrase in describing her general appearance was, that she was a miserable, poor-looking creature. He was under the impression that she must be the woman who had been left by the proprietor in charge of the house, and who had that evening, after having given up the keys, remained for some little time with the female servants. He coughed, therefore, to apprise her of his presence, and turned again towards the wall. When he again looked round, she and the light were gone, and odd as was her method of lighting herself in her search, the circumstances excited neither uneasiness nor curiosity in his mind, until he discovered next morning 
that the woman in question had left the house long before he had gone to his bed. I examined the man very closely as to the appearance of the person who had visited him, and the result was what I have described. It struck me as an odd thing, that even then, considering how prone to superstition persons in his rank of life usually are, he did not seem to suspect anything supernatural in the occurrence, and, on the contrary, was thoroughly persuaded that his visitant was a living person, who had got into the house by some hidden entrance. On Sunday, on his return from his place of worship, he told me that, when the service was ended, and the congregation making their way slowly out, he saw the very woman in the crowd, and kept his eye upon her for several minutes, but such was the crush that all his efforts to reach her were unavailing, and when he got into the open street, she was gone. He was quite positive as to his having distinctly seen her, however, for several minutes, and scouted the possibility of any mistake as to identity, and fully impressed with the substantial and living reality of his visitant, he was very much provoked at her having escaped him. He made inquiries also in the neighbourhood, but could procure no information, nor hear of any other person's having seen any woman corresponding with his visitant. The cook and the housemaid occupied a bedroom on the kitchen floor. It had whitewashed walls, and they were actually terrified by the appearance of the shadow of a woman passing and repassing across the side wall opposite to their beds. They suspected that this had been going on much longer than they were aware, for its presence was discovered by a sort of accident, its movements happening to take a direction in distinct contrariety to theirs. This shadow always moved upon one particular wall, returning after short intervals, and causing them extreme terror. They placed the candle, as the most obvious specific, so close to the infested wall, that the flame all but touched it, and believed for some time that they had effectually got rid of this annoyance. But one night, notwithstanding this arrangement of the light, the shadow returned, passing and repassing, as heretofore, upon the same wall, although their only candle was burning within an inch of it, and it was obvious that no substance capable of casting such a shadow could have interposed, and indeed, as they described it, the shadow seemed to have no sort of relation to the position of the light, and appeared, as I have said, in manifest defiance of the laws of optics. I ought to mention that the housemaid was a particularly fearless sort of person, as well as a very honest one, and her companion, the cook, a scrupulously religious woman, and both agreed in every particular in their relation of what occurred. Meanwhile, the nursery was not without its annoyances, though as yet of a comparatively trivial kind. Sometimes, at night, the handle of the door was turned hurriedly, as if by a person trying to come in, and at others a knocking was made at it. These sounds occurred after the children had settled to sleep, and while the nurse still remained awake, whenever she called to know who is there, the sound ceased, but several times, and particularly at first, she was under the impression that they were caused by her mistress, who had come to see the children, and thus in prayer she had got up and opened the door, expecting to see her, but discovering only darkness, and receiving no answer to her inquiries. With respect to this nurse, I must mention that I believe no more perfectly trustworthy servant was ever employed in her capacity, and, in addition to her integrity, she was remarkably gifted with sound common sense. One morning, I think about three or four weeks after our arrival, I was sitting at the parlour window which looked to the front, when I saw the little iron door which admitted into the small garden that lay between the window where I was sitting and the public road, pushed open by a woman, who so exactly answered the description given by Smith of the woman who had visited his room on the night of his arrival as instantaneously to impress me with the conviction that she must be the identical person. She was a square, short woman, dressed in soiled and tattered clothes, scarred and pitted with smallpox, and blind of an eye. She stepped hurriedly into the little enclosure, and peered from a distance of a few yards into the room where I was sitting. I felt that now was the moment to clear the matter up, but there was something stealthy in the manner and look of the woman, which convinced me that I must not appear to notice her until her retreat was fairly cut off. Unfortunately, I was suffering from a lame foot, and could not reach the bell as quickly as I wished. 
I made all the haste I could, and rang violently to bring up the servant Smith. In the short interval that intervened, I observed the woman from the window, who having in a leisurely way, and with a kind of scrutiny, looked along the front windows of the house, passed quickly out again, closing the gate after her, and followed a lady who was walking along the footpath at a quick pace, as if with the intention of begging from her. The moment the man entered, I told him, "'The blind woman you described to me has this instant followed a lady in that direction. Try to overtake her!' He was, if possible, more eager than I in the chase, but returned in a short time after a vain pursuit, very hot and utterly disappointed, and thereafter we saw her face no more. All this time, and up to the period of our leaving the house, which was not for two or three months later, there occurred at intervals the only phenomenon in the entire series having any resemblance to what we hear described of spiritualism. This was a knocking, like a soft hammering with a wooden mallet, as it seemed in the timbers between the bedroom ceilings and the roof. It had this special peculiarity, that it was always rhythmical, and, I think, invariably, the emphasis upon the last stroke. It would sound rapidly, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, one, two, three, and sometimes one, two, one, two, and this with intervals and resumptions monotonously for hours at a time. At first this caused my wife, who was a good deal confined to her bed, much annoyance, and we sent to our neighbours to inquire if any hammering or carpentering was going on in their houses, but were informed that nothing of the sort was taking place. I have myself heard it frequently, always in the same inaccessible part of the house, and with the same monotonous emphasis. One odd thing about it was, that on my wife's calling out, as she used to do when it became more than usually troublesome, stop that noise, it was invariably arrested for a longer or shorter time. Of course, none of these occurrences were ever mentioned in hearing of the children— they would have been, no doubt, like most children, greatly terrified had they heard anything of the matter, and known that their elders were unable to account for what was passing, and their fears would have made them wretched and troublesome. They used to play for some hours every day in the back garden, the house forming one end of this oblong enclosure, the stable and coach-house the other, and two parallel walls of considerable height the sides. Here, as it afforded a perfectly safe playground, they were frequently left quite to themselves, and in talking over their day's adventures, as children will, they happened to mention a woman, or rather, the woman, for they had long grown familiar with her appearance, whom they used to see in the garden while they were at play. They assumed that she came in and went out at the stable door, but they never actually saw her enter or depart. They merely saw a figure, that of a very poor woman, soiled and ragged, near the stable wall, stooping over the ground, and apparently grabbing in the loose clay in search of something. She did not disturb or appear to observe them, and they left her in undisturbed possession of her nook of ground. When seen, it was always in the same spot, and similarly occupied, and the description they gave of her general appearance, for they never saw her face, corresponded with that of the one-eyed woman whom Smith, and subsequently, as it seemed, I had seen. The other man, James, who looked after a mare which I had purchased for the purpose of riding exercise, had, like every one else in the house, his little trouble to report, though it was not much. The stall in which, as the most comfortable it was decided to place her, she preemptorily declined to enter. Though a very docile and gentle little animal, there was no getting her into it. She would snort and rear, and, in fact, do or suffer anything rather than set her hoof in it. He was fain, therefore, to place her in another, and on several occasions he found her there, exhibiting all the equine symptoms of extreme fear. Like the rest of us, however, this man was not troubled in the particular case with any superstitious qualms. The mare had evidently been frightened, and he was puzzled to find out how or by whom, for the stable was well secured, and had, I am nearly certain, a lock-up yard outside. One morning, I was greeted with the intelligence that robbers had certainly got into the house in the night, and that one of them had actually been seen in the nursery. The witness, 
I found, was my eldest child, then, as I have said, about nine years of age. Having awoke in the night, and lain awake for some time in her bed, she heard the handle of the door turn, and a person whom she distinctly saw, for it was a light night, and the window shutters unclosed, but whom she had never seen before, stepped in on tiptoe, and with an appearance of great caution. He was a rather small man, with a very red face. He wore an oddly cut frock coat, the collar of which stood up, and trousers rough and wide like those of a sailor, turned up at the ankles, and either short boots or clumsy shoes covered with mud. This man listened beside the nurse's bed, which stood next the door, as if to satisfy himself that she was sleeping soundly, and having done so for some seconds, he began to move cautiously in a diagonal line across the room to the chimney-piece, where he stood for a while, and so resumed his tiptoe walk, skirting the wall, until he reached a chest of drawers, some of which were open, and into which he looked, and began to rummage in a hurried way, as the child supposed, making search for something worth taking away. He then passed on to the window, where was a dressing-table, at which he also stopped, turning over the things upon it, and standing for some time at the window as if looking out, and then resuming his walk by the side wall opposite to that by which he had moved up to the window, he returned in the same way toward the nurse's bed, so as to reach it at the foot. With its side to the end wall, in which was the door, was placed the little bed in which lay my eldest child, who watched his proceedings with the extremest terror. As he drew near, she instinctively moved herself in the bed, with her head and shoulders to the wall, drawing up her feet, but he passed by without appearing to observe, or at least to care for her presence. Immediately after, the nurse turned in her bed, as if about to waken, and when the child, who had drawn the clothes about her head, again ventured to peep out, the man was gone. The child had no idea of her having seen anything more formidable than a thief, with the prowling, cautious, and noiseless manner of proceeding common to such marauders, the air and movements of the man whom she had seen entirely corresponded, and on hearing her perfectly distinct and consistent account, I could myself arrive at no other conclusion than that a stranger had actually got into the house. I had, therefore, in the first instance, a most careful examination made, to discover any traces of an entrance having been made by any window into the house. The doors had been found barred and locked as usual, but no sign of anything of the sort was discernible. I then had the various articles, plate, wearing apparel, books, etc., counted, and after having conned over and reckoned up everything, it became quite clear that nothing whatever had been removed from the house, nor was there the slightest indication of anything having been so much as disturbed there. I must here state that this child was remarkably clear, intelligent, and observant, and that her description of the man, and of all that had occurred, was most exact, and as detailed as the want of perfect light rendered possible. I felt assured that an entrance had actually been effected into the house, though for what purpose was not easily to be conjectured. The man, Smith, was equally confident upon this point, and his theory was that the object was simply to frighten us out of the house by making us believe it haunted, and he was more than ever anxious and on the alert to discover the conspirators. It often since appeared to me odd, every year indeed more odd, as this cumulative case of the marvellous becomes to my mind more and more inexplicable, that underlying my sense of mystery and puzzle was all along the quiet assumption that all these occurrences were one way or another referable to natural causes. I could not account for them indeed myself, but during the whole period I inhabited that house I never once felt, though much alone, and often up very late at night, any of those tremors and thrills which every one has at times experienced when situation and the hour are favourable except the cook and housemaid, who were plagued with the shadow I mentioned crossing and recrossing upon the bedroom wall, we all, without exception, experienced the same strange sense of security, and regarded these phenomena rather with a perplexed sort of interest and curiosity than with any more unpleasant sensations. The knockings which I have mentioned at the nursery door 
preceded generally by the sound of a step on the lobby, meanwhile continued. At that time, for my wife, like myself, was an invalid, two eminent physicians, who came out occasionally by rail, were attending us. These gentlemen were at first only amused, but ultimately interested, and very much puzzled by the occurrences which we described. One of them, at last, recommended that a candle should be kept burning upon the lobby. It was, in fact, a recurrence to an old woman's recipe against ghosts. Of course, it might be serviceable, too, against impostors. At all events, seeming, as I have said, very much interested and puzzled, he advised it, and it was tried. We fancied that it was successful, for there was an interval of quiet for, I think, three or four nights. But after that, the noises, the footsteps on the lobby, the knocking at the door, and the turning of the handle, recommenced in full force, notwithstanding the light upon the table outside— and these particular phenomena became only more perplexing than ever. The alarm of robbers and smugglers gradually subsided, after a week or two, but we were again to hear news from the nursery. Our second little girl, then between seven and eight years of age, saw in the night-time, she alone being awake, a young woman with black or very dark hair, which hung loose and with a black cloak on, standing near the middle of the floor, opposite the hearthstone, and fronting the foot of her bed. She appeared quite unobservant of the children and nurse sleeping in the room. She was very pale, and looked, the child said, both sorry and frightened, and with something very peculiar and terrible about her eyes, which made the child conclude that she was dead. She was looking, not at, but in the direction of the child's bed, and there was a dark streak across her throat, like a scar with blood upon it. This figure was not motionless, but once or twice turned slowly, and without appearing to be conscious of the presence of the child, or the other occupants of the room, like a person in vacancy or abstraction. There was on this occasion a nightlight burning in the chamber, and the child saw, or thought she saw, all these particulars with the most perfect distinctness, she got her head under the bedclothes, and although a good many years have passed since then, she cannot recall the spectacle without feelings of peculiar horror. One day, when the children were playing in the back garden, I asked them to point out to me the spot where they were accustomed to see the woman, who occasionally showed herself as I have described, near the stable wall. There was no division of opinion as to this precise point, which they indicated in the most distinct and confident way. I suggested that, perhaps, something might be hidden there in the ground, and advised them digging a hole there with their little spades, to try for it. Accordingly, to work they went, and by my return in the evening, they had grabbed up a piece of a jawbone, with several teeth in it. The bone was very much decayed, and ready to crumble to pieces, but the teeth were quite sound. I could not tell whether they were human grinders, but I showed the fossil to one of the physicians I have mentioned, who came out the next evening, and he pronounced them human teeth. The same conclusion was come to a day or two later by the other medical man. It appears to me now, on reviewing the whole matter, almost unaccountable that, with such evidence before me, I should not have got in a labourer, and had the spot effectually dug and searched. I can only say that so it was." I was quite satisfied of the moral truth of every word that had been related to me, and which I have here set down with scrupulous accuracy. But I experienced an apathy, for which neither then nor afterwards did I quite know how to account. I had a vague but immovable impression that the whole affair was referable to natural agencies. It was not until some time after we had left the house, which— by the by, we afterwards found had had the reputation of being haunted before we had come to live in it, that on reconsideration I discovered the serious difficulty of accounting satisfactorily for all that had occurred upon ordinary principles. A great deal we might arbitrarily set down to imagination, but even in so doing there was, in Limini, the oddity, not to say improbability, of so many different persons having nearly simultaneously suffered from different spectral and other illusions during the short period for which we had occupied that house, who never before, nor so far as we learned afterwards, were troubled by any fears or fancies of the sort. There were other things, too, not to be so accounted for. 
the odd knockings in the roof I frequently heard myself. There were also, which I before forgot to mention in the daytime, rappings at the doors of the sitting-rooms, which constantly deceived us, and it was not till our come-in was unanswered, and the hall or passage outside the door was discovered to be empty, that we learned that whatever else caused them, human hands did not. All the persons who reported having seen the different persons or appearances here described by me were just as confident of having literally and distinctly seen them, as I was of having seen the hard-featured woman with the blind eye so remarkably corresponding with Smith's description. About a week after the discovery of the teeth, which were found, I think, about two feet under the ground, a friend, much advanced in years, and who remembered the town in which we had now taken up our abode for a very long time, happened to pay us a visit. He good-humouredly pooh-poohed the whole thing, but at the same time was evidently curious about it. "'We might construct a sort of story,' said I. "'I am giving, of course, the substance and purport, not the exact words of our dialogue.' and assign to each of the three figures who appeared their respective parts in some dreadful tragedy enacted in this house. The male figure represents the murderer, the ill-looking one-eyed woman, his accomplice, who, we will suppose, buried the body where she is now so often seen grubbing in the earth, and where the human teeth and jawbone have so lately been disinterred, and the young woman with the dishevelled tresses and black cloak and the bloody scar across her throat, their victim— a difficulty, however, which I cannot get over, exists in the cheerfulness, the great publicity, and the evident very recent date of the house. Why, as to that, said he, the house is not modern. It and those beside it formed an old government store, altered and fitted up recently, as you see. I remember it well in my young days, fifty years ago, before the town had grown out in this direction, and a more entirely lonely spot— or one more fitted for the commission of a secret crime, could not have been imagined. I have nothing to add, for very soon after this my physician pronounced a longer stay unnecessary for my health, and we took our departure for another place of abode. I may add that although I have resided for considerable periods in many other houses, I never experienced any annoyances of a similar kind elsewhere. Neither have I made, stupid dog, you will say, any inquiries respecting either the antecedents or subsequent history of the house, in which we made so disturbed a sojourn. I was content with what I knew, and have here related as clearly as I could, and I think it is a very pretty puzzle as it stands. Thus ends the statement, which we abandon to the ingenuity of our readers, having ourselves no satisfactory explanation to suggest— and simply repeating the assurance with which we prefaced it, namely that we can vouch for the perfect good faith and the accuracy of the narrator. E. D. U. M. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this reading, feel free to follow the links on screen to other readings here at Horror Babble. Until next time.